Welcome everyone to the 2DCC webinar featuring Dr. James Home from Columbia University. He is the Wang Fong Jin Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Columbia and also the director for MERSEC, the Center for Precision Assembled Quantum Materials. Dr. Home, please go ahead with your presentation. Great, thank you, Kevin. Can everybody hear me okay? I think you can. Um, so the other MERSEC director in the audience will notice that I have my our old MERSEC logo <laughs> on here. We uh, were just uh, successfully recompeted, so we're happy about that, but we haven't uh, yet uh, finished our new logo, so we're stuck with the old one. But anyway, it's great to be talking to this group. Um, I'm gonna talk, I, this is uh, very similar to uh, material I presented uh, over the last couple of years, but always updating with the latest results. So this has kind of been a, you know, four four year obsession of ours uh, to really get this material system clean that I'll be telling you about. Right. Okay, so again, what I'm going to talk about today is is trying to get to the intrinsic limit where we're seeing the the intrinsic behavior of these amazing materials, the monolayer transition metal dichalcogenides. So as a very, very quick uh, overview, because I think this audience doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, the TMDs are a, a fascinating class of materials. Um, many are, and the ones I'm going to be talking about today are the 2H phase semiconducting transition metal dichalcogenides, such as molybdenum sulfide, molyb uh, tungsten sulfide, and specifically, we're going to be focusing on molyselenide and tungsten selenide. In these uh, uh, semiconductors, uh, once you go to the monolayer, uh, there's a transition from being indirect band gap semiconductors to direct band gap semiconductors. So this gives you outstanding optical properties. Um, we also have a very interesting physics that arises out of the spin valley uh, coupling due to the strong spin orbit uh, coupling in, in, in these materials. So you'll have spin polarized K and K prime valleys, which are gonna be very interesting as we, we uh, move through the talk. Um, in these monolayer semiconductors, there's very strong carrier-carrier uh, uh, interactions. And one of the results of that is that all of the uh, optical uh, spectral weight, as is a, almost all of it is, is in the uh, excitonic transitions. And so uh, when we look at the photoluminescence from these materials, we see a strong peak from, the, from exciton emission rather than band-to-band -band emission. And then finally, these make good field effect transistors. So they're of, of you know, great interest for next generation electronics, flexible electronics, things like that. But with all of these two dimensional materials, as we get them atomically thin, we have multiple challenges that arise. And the ones I'm gonna talk about today are reducing disorder. And we can think of that as disorder for uh, you know, atomically thin materials is arising kind of equally from two different sources. First, we can think about the intrinsic disorder. How clean is the material itself? Uh, what are the grain boundaries or vacancies or other types of point defects? But also we have to think about the extrinsic disorder uh, because every atom is at or near the surface. So we have to be very careful about things like charge impurities and adsorbates as well as things like strain. Now, uh, in the kind of early days of, of study of these monolayers, uh, what we saw was that both in the electronic transport and the optical uh, studies of these materials, that really the properties were far uh, uh, inferior to what we were hoping for and expecting in, from the kind of pure material. For instance, the, the disorder limited uh, mobility at low temperature was limited to about 200 centimeters squared per volt second. Um, uh, you know, far below what we were seeing for graphene of, of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. Um, and if we looked at the photoluminescence peaks, there was a lot of inhomogeneous broadening of these peaks. And so the question is, you know, what's causing this, this imperfect behavior? Well, we had a hint, and the hint came from uh, our st previous studies of graphene. So we, you know, starting uh, a little over I guess about 11 years ago now, 
uh, we started stacking graphene on boron nitride to eliminate the disorder from the silicon dioxide substrate. And over the years, this is from our uh, review paper that we published last year, where we kind of arbitrarily, uh, semi-arbitrarily broke kind of the progress over the last 10 years into roughly four generations, where we went from just exfoliating directly onto silicon dioxide to then using polymers to transfer onto hexagonal boron nitride, this kind of magic, very low disorder uh, dielectric. Then we moved to dry encapsulation between hexagonal boron nitride, and then finally to uh, encapsulating those within graphite gates to further reduce the electrostatic disorder. And we can see from this kind of from this uh, TEM cross-sectional image that when we do this encapsulation, we can actually get amazingly pure uh, interfaces. Uh, you know, this is astounding when you think that all of these interfaces, all of these devices are assembled on a desktop where there's all kinds of uh, aromatics in the air and all surfaces are covered with contamination, but the surfaces seem to be self-cleaning. They tend to expel uh, contaminants and we can get these kind of perfect new van der Waals heterostructures. So with graphene, this was a very beautiful story. And what we can see is that when we measure the uh, transport behavior of graphene, we see the effects of the reduced charge disorder. So for example, when you just measure uh, conductivity as a function of carrier density on the x-axis, we see the very familiar peak at charge neutrality, this Dirac peak. And um, you can show from theory that the, the, the width of this peak correlates quite well to the charge disorder in the system. And what we see is just from looking at the, the width of that peak that we've reduced our charge disorder from on silicon dioxide, our first generation to uh, mid 10 to the 11 per square centimeter to now in our fourth generation, we're in the mid 10 to the nine per square centimeter. And this is pretty similar to what you can get in uh, suspended graphene. So we're seem to be very close to eliminating external disorder in, in graphene, although there probably still is some disorder likely from defects in the boron nitride, although we're not sure. Uh, when, of course, we can see the, the effects of this lower disorder, not just in the kind of DC transport, but in the quantum transport at high magnetic fields. So for instance, if we just look at this kind of across those four generations, uh, we can see that the original graphene samples showed the famous fourfold degenerate uh, integer quantum Hall effect. But as we got cleaner, we started to see the uh, all of the integer states, so we broke that fourfold degeneracy. Then we started to see fractional states. And in the most recent samples, we've seen the kind of huge variety of fractional states, including even denominator states uh, in some cases. Uh, and if you, I think, I'm not sure, no. If you, if you kind of take this quantum Hall spectrum that I'm showing on the right and line that up to recent results on uh, gallium arsenide, to the moderately trained eye, not to the, the, the kind of deep expert, but to the moderately trained eye, there's not a huge difference. You're really seeing many, many of the same, most I would say of the same quantum Hall states that you can observe in gallium arsenide, you can now observe in graphene. Okay, so the question is, does all of this miracle happen when we just put our transition metal dicalcogenides in between hexagonal boron nitride? So we started doing that again now about six years ago. Uh, we can make beautiful stacks. Again, they, they seem to be in many cases as clean as we get with graphene. And in fact, we see improvements in mobility uh, we and others have seen quantum oscillations, so the beginnings of quantum transport, and we see a narrowing of the photoluminescence line width. So all of this looks good, but it's not nearly the, the miracle we saw with graphene. So the mobility is still limited to the range of about 10,000 or kind of one to 10,000, I would say. Uh, the quantum Hall effect is, has not been seen to be fully developed. And the, if we look at the photoluminescence, you have narrow line width, but still quite low quantum yield. So something is still not perfect in this system. 
And what we realized a few years ago was that the, the thing that was not perfect was that the materials themselves. So the 2D, uh, the, the transition metal dichalcogenides are actually full of defects in, in most cases, right? So this is an example. So what we do to characterize these defects is we just load a bulk crystal into a, a scanning tunneling microscope and just cleave it under ultra high vacuum. So we have a very clean surface, no processing at all. And then we just go and look at the surface of that uh, crystal in, in STM. And you know what we find when we take, say, a, a commercially grown uh, uh, sample of molybdenum selenide, these are grown by chemical vapor transport. Uh, of course, kind of on a large scale, they, they look horribly disordered. And we, when we zoom in, we do get atomic resolution, but we see all kinds of uh, point defects. These defects look larger than one lattice site, but when we zoom in, we actually see that they're centered on single lattice sites, either calcogen sites or metal sites. Um, and so what we're seeing here, even though this defect looks large, but it's actually, we believe, a single point defect where the change in modulation of the density of states extends over a few lattice constants. Uh, but the big thing here is that the de defect density is extremely high, almost, in some cases, 10 to the 13 per square centimeter. Uh, you know, just for reference, the defect density in graphene is, is 10 to the 9 or, or lower, right? So this is much, much worse. Um, again, we can look at these defects. We can see whether just from S scanning tunneling spectroscopy, we can see whether they're donor or acceptors. Again, we think our, our metal vacancies are these uh, acceptor states. And um, just looking at the literature, we're not the only ones who have looked at defects in TMDs, but what the interesting thing is that samples prepared in different ways actually show different types and different uh, dis different distribution of defects and and kind of you know different types of defects so for instance uh, samples grown by um, chemical vapor deposition or physical vapor deposition tend to have a high density of, of calcogen vacancies because of the high the very different um, uh, a very different vapor pressure of the metal and calcogen during the growth. Right? Of course, this can change depending on the growth recipe and the day you're doing it and all of that. Um, but, you know, just to say that TMDs are one material is very tricky because how it's grown, who grew it, at what time, all of this can change uh, the, the, the defects that you have in the crystal, which can be a dominant factor in a lot of properties. So what we started doing about uh, four years ago was growing our own crystals. Uh, we, instead of using CVT, we do that a little bit, but we've mostly used a flux synthesis technique. So this involves just basically sealing the metal and calcogen powders inside a quartz ampule, evacuating it, and then cooking it in an oven at high temperature, about a thousand degrees C for some weeks, and then slowly cooling down um, to, to obtain our crystal. When we do this, just this is kind of our, some of our nicest uh, STM images. You can see on the left, a highly defective uh, sample that we grew by uh, chemical vapor transport. And on the right, you can see on the same size scale with atomic resolution, here's our flux, here's a, a sample of very high quality flux grown tungsten selenide. So much, much, much cleaner material. Okay, so um, let me just give a kind of a three or four slides on uh, kind of our progress in this material synthesis and, and kind of what our status is right now. So we've done over this time, uh, you know, the first thing we had to do was kind of re rebuild some old SDMs. So we now have two SDMs that are completely dedicated just to uh, characterization of these crystals. So we needed the high it's not high throughput, but uh, you know we had we couldn't ask our friends uh, in the STM lab to keep looking at crystals for us. We needed some dedicated systems just for doing this. We found some old ones, got them working again, and now we can. Every time we do a growth, we take we sample 
and look at look at the material we're getting out. So we can play now with things like different tungsten to selenium ratios in tungsten selenide. And what we found, for instance, is that when we have uh, a lower tungsten selenide tungsten uh, concentration, so a higher selenium concentration, uh, we seem to see a much lower density of defects that are probably the tungsten uh, vacancies. Uh, we've also done more careful scans at, you know, so when you look at these images, you say, wow, this is great. This is a, seems to be a very, very low density of these very bright, obvious defects. But we have also tried to be very careful. Uh, and when we zoom in, we actually see lots of very faint little defects here. You can see these kind of faint white spots. And this, you know, we started noticing these a couple of years ago, and it gave us kind of all kinds of fits. Uh, we went to Brookhaven and did x-ray fluorescence on these crystals, and these were showing a lot of uh, impurity atoms in our crystals. So what we've done in the last uh, year or so is try to kind of clean up our synthesis processes to eliminate potential uh, sources of these impurity atoms. And when we do that, what we now get is... Uh, we, we're, we basically get rid of those faint defects. We don't really see them anymore. We're just still left with the bright defects, which we think, again, are either vacancies or um, anti-site defects. Not 100% sure yet. Uh, but now our average defect density is, is reaching the 10 to the 10 uh, uh, level or below. Right, So I, I show on the left, this is a kind of a large scale image to see these bright defects. And then when we zoom in in this area, we really see none of those faint defects that we were seeing before. So just to give a kind of a status update here. So this is our tungsten selenide, our, our defect density here, we're seeing uh, around or below 10 to the 10 per square centimeter. And in our moly selenide, we're actually getting somewhat better results. So here again are the kind of large defects, but you can see very few of them in this uh, 500 by 500 nanometer scan. We think our average defect density here is below is, is below 5 times 10 to the 9 per square centimeter. So a huge improvement, uh, at least three orders of magnitude from the commercially available stuff that we were working with you know, three or four years ago. Okay, so that's kind of end of part one. That's our status update on this slow and painful synthesis process. But with this kind of grinding away and really looking carefully at all of the, the batches of crystals we grow and paying very close attention to defects, we make, we've made some great progress. I can pause here for questions on that, or and then I can move on. If you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. Those who are not familiar, you can temporarily unmute yourself with your space button. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so one uh, quick question. Could you, could you comment on what Sorry. is the background carrier concentration in those samples with such a low defect density? Uh, still to be determined. Uh, that's a that's a good question. It, when we do scanning tunneling spectroscopy of monolayers, we see that the Fermi level is inside the gap. Um, when we measure bulk crystals, they seem to be very slightly n-doped um, of the the tongue of both materials actually. Um, but uh, th that yeah, so we, we still have to do the kind of the Hall effect measurements and things like that to really nail down what, what our carrier concentration is. But it's they, they seem to be slightly N-dope, but pretty close to intrinsic. Hi, Professor Hones. Uh, I had a small question. Um, is there a way of finding out the defects without you using STM? <laughs> so this is something I've actually been talking to my colleagues here at Penn State about. Um, and the, the, the short answer is not yet, but I, I very much hope so because it's you know painful to do everything with STM. So uh, we've tried Raman. So we, we're working with a group at 
NIST. I think I saw Angie on the call. Um, <laughs> we were hoping to find, if we looked very, very carefully, we, uh, we were hoping to find a, a signature of defects in Raman. Um, we haven't been able to see that yet. Um, but I, you know, I think still optic, there are other optical spectroscopy techniques uh, that are, show promise. One of them, I don't have any slides on this. Um, if when I when I show the optical properties, what we'll what we'll see is that the carrier lifetime or the like the exciton lifetime is much longer in the purer materials because there are fewer uh, sites for non-radiative recombination. So if you have probes of excited state lifetime, that's a very good measure of your defect density. And so we've we have some preliminary measurements of photoconductivity, uh, which seem to be pretty promising for that. Thank Jim, you. one more question. Okay. Um, so CVT definitely gives you good bulk crystals, and then you you probably have to exfoliate if you want to get uh, monolayer samples or, or something like that. So, do you know how to translate what you found for the CVT to other methods? Uh, I'm not sure the question. So, so are you asking about? The yeah, so so the method that I, I understood that the results that you obtained there they are done with this uh, um, uh, careful um, growth in the ampule, yeah, uh, and 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 that one is is not what normally people do to get kind of just the monolayer growth like you do in CVD or, or oh other. I see yeah yeah so that... is there a way to translate what you yeah. learned so far to get low defect uh, things to, to grow layers of material and not bulks, right? Now I understand, yeah. So the question is, does anything we've learned about bulk crystal synthesis translate to thin film synthesis? Um, not that I know of is the un unfortunate short answer, but I do think, you know, what, what we hope to do is certainly, you know, I think that the previous question was, can we find ways to measure defect density rapidly? And you know, when we start to make very low defect density materials, um, you know, can we? And and I'll show this at the at the end of the talk. Can we start measuring bulk properties as a function of defect density? So at least, can we provide good metrology for the community? So if you're growing bulk crystals, can you know? My my hope is that we will find good ways to very rapidly measure defect density and maybe even type of defect so that at least, you know, the film growers can iterate their processes uh, to improve quality uh, without having to do STM every time, which is horrible and painful. Thank you. Yep. Hello, Professor Hone. Uh, I was curious to how you get the defect concentration from the STM images. Uh, it's just counting. So we just, you know, we basically, so if you look at this, right, we have a defect, you know, we have an STM that image that's 500 by 500 nanometers, and we just count one, two, three, four big defects. They're probably, you know, there's some question about when they're a little bit fainter, or is that because they're one layer below? So, you know, we okay, so it's just manual uncertainty here, but it's just counting. Um, you know, we're not trying to give this plus or minus 2%. So, you know, it, at this point, we don't care about, you know, being completely rigorous, but we do check and make sure that we see roughly the same defect density all over the crystal. Thanks. So, I'd, so I assume a lot of these uh, defects um, are out of uh, equilibrium, but is it possible to compare um, the measured uh, defect concentrations with uh, the theory ones that are yeah, that's that's uh, something we've been um, thinking about for a long time, and you know uh -huh. maybe that's something we'll try to work with folks at two DCC about. Um, one of the issues, so yeah, so the question is, can you estimate the equilibrium defect density? Right. Um, and you're you're absolutely right that that you know right now, especially at the very high defect densities, certainly that's a non-equilibrium. It's all kinetics. Um, one of the issues we found is just even calculate, calculating the defect energies, having the correct reference of the chemical potential is actually a tricky problem. So, you know, you can, I think, right. run it through DFT in a kind of 
dumb way and get an answer, but uh, it's it's still on. We haven't come to a, a good conclusion about exactly what the right reference state is, and that really makes a big difference. Right. Thanks. Okay. okay. So let me maybe move on now to um, some of our studies of, of transport and then optical properties in these materials. I'll, I think I'll, I'll try to go through the transport stuff quickly and spend a little more time on the optical studies. Uh, so again, now that we grow these nicer crystals, can we see improvements in the transport properties? A lot of these studies are ongoing, even just basic measurements of mobility. But let me just show a first, first things really quick. Um, uh, again, you know, studies of, uh, of CBT grown crystals showed quantum oscillations, but did not show fully developed quantum Hall effect. And relatively recently, we're still writing this paper up. Uh, we've shown now fully developed uh, quantum Hall effect in, I think this is bilayer tungsten selenide. Uh, another very interesting thing that you can see in, in kind of probes of Landau levels in the TMDs is this uh, uh, valley polarization, right? So if you think about the, the K and K prime valleys, so we're going to look at the uh, uh, valence band of tungsten selenide. The, the K and K prime valleys are spin polarized, and that means when you turn on a magnetic field, they're going to shift in energy. And if you're starting in the gap and filling these states, you're going to fill one. Uh, you're going to fill only one valley for a little while until you've gone far enough, and then you're going to start alternating, filling k prime and k, k prime and k, right? So um, there, this, this, we should be able to see this, and I'll show that. And then in what I'll show uh, next is uh, actually. Another interesting consequence of this valley spin uh, locking is that when in natural bilayers, actually we'll see that this, this uh, spin valley coupling actually decouples the, the individual layers because to go uh, from one layer to another at the same momentum, you actually have to flip spin. Okay, so again, what we're gonna first look for is the signature of this kind of polarized Landau levels to then alternating uh, Landau level structure. We're going to probe that using a capacitance technique, which basically measures the compressibility of the sample rather than transport, which needs it, it, making good contacts is still pretty challenging. Uh, so this is our kind of first result in this. This is published uh, two and a half years ago now, just uh, comparing the quality of data that we saw with CVT grown material versus flux grown material. This is kind of our first generation of flux grown material. And you can see a, just an enormous difference uh, in the flux grown material. We can resolve both the um, conduction and valence band and, and you know, see a beautiful kind of Landau fan. And when we start to get to higher Landau levels, we start to see this even odd filling pattern that we don't see at the, at the bottom of the bands. So again, here we have kind of uh, evenly spaced levels. And then right about here, we start to see this even odd uh, grouping. This is more recent data uh, on monolayer tungsten selenide. Now we've been able to uh, extend these measurements all the way to the band edge. And again, we're starting, to, we can see very clearly this transition between this uh, kind of uniform filling and this even odd filling as we go to higher Landau levels. Uh, we can also see, so here we have the new equals one state right here, and you can see in the capacitance map a very faint hint of something that's happening even below new equals one. So we took that to the high magnetic field lab. Uh, I think this is that, I think I have it up here, right? Yeah, 29 Tesla. So a 29 Tesla, now we can actually resolve these uh, states in between new equals zero and new equals one and new equals two very clearly. And we are starting to see fractional quantum Hall states. And even interestingly, even just in this first observation of fractional states, we're seeing an even denominator state as well. Um, so this is very exciting to, to see fractional quantum Hall effect in, in a 2D semiconductor for the first time. Um, the other interesting thing in this in this study is that actually we see a different pattern of, of kind of which 
fractional states are dominant and in different Landau levels. And that actually can be pretty well understood uh, by kind of uh, the competition between the kind of fractional quantum Hall states, charge density wave states, and uh, kind of Wigner crystal states. And actually this, uh, the, the pattern we see in the TMDs actually fits the relatively straightforward theory much more easily than gallium arsenide or other materials do. So I, in some ways, tungsten selenide is a more ideal model uh, 2D uh, system than, than others. Okay, going on to the results for bilayer uh, tungsten selenide. So again, the idea here is when we have two layers in the 2H phase, the kind of natural bilayer phase, the, the alternate layers are, are oriented in different directions. And that means in momentum space on top of every K valley is a K prime valley and vice versa. And those valleys are uh, oppositely spin polarized. And so to go just to make a transition at the same momentum, you have to flip spin or to keep to maintain spin, you have to have a large change in momentum and both of those things and clean samples are going to become less and less likely. So we can actually see that even just in zero magnetic field. So if we look at the capacitance of our structure, we can see kind of a very faint boundary. You can see this boundary here and here. And this is a boundary between areas where we're charging only one layer in the top layer or the bottom layer, or in some cases in, in this middle region, we're charging both layers at the same time. When we turn on a magnetic field, now all of these uh, states break up into Landau levels. And again, we see the Landau level structure change dramatically when, we're, when we go from this kind of single layer state there, we just see kind of a nice sequence of Landau levels. Over here, we see a nice sequence of Landau levels from the bottom. And in the middle, now we're populating both, but we're populating each uh, layer uh, discreetly. So we can actually map out kind of almost like quantum dot spectroscopy. We can map out the Landau level filling of each layer separately. So rather than uh, considering the, the two layers to be a single quantum well. Um, the, the other interesting thing is that in, during the charge transfer between these layers, we don't see this uh, kind of integer filling gap, except sometimes. Sometimes this, this gap uh, reappears again, and, and that can be interpreted as the signature of an exciton condensate, where we have uh, states residing on the top and bottom layers, forming bound excitons, and then condensing through Bose-Einstein condensation. So this is a very interesting system. This is really kind of the, the most strongly interacting bilayer state that you can get. You know, normally these kind of quantum Hall bilayers are made by putting a spacer in between two dimensional electron gases. Here, because of the natural physics of the, of the material, we don't need a spacer and we can get now as close as the two layer spacing, which gives us extremely access to kind of the extremely strong coupling regime that hasn't been seen before. Okay, changing gears again, let me talk about two, uh, two studies of optical properties in these high purity materials. The first is on quantum emitters in tungsten selenide and the second which I'll spend a little more time on is uh, our study of, of trions in Mali selenide. So this is uh, work that was led by uh, Xiaodong Zhu at University of Washington. Uh, so he, his group uh, identified uh, some kind of new states in the uh, optical, uh, the, the photoluminescence map uh, of uh, tungsten, mon uh, uh, sorry, monolayer tungsten selenide. So, uh, in, in these materials here, we see the exciton, here we see the trion states, and there's some kind of more complicated states here, but this is the, these are the new spectra of interest, um, which hadn't been seen before. See, these are narrow emission lines and they're only seen at positive gate voltage where we're, the material is negatively charged. And we can see that those have a very different power dependence than the uh, kind of the normal states. They actually are suppressed at high power, which tells us that we have some kind of saturation. Uh, and they also have extremely long lifetimes, so they can measure both the kind of polarization lifetime and just the overall 
photoluminescence lifetime. And you know, what they see is that this lifetime is, is in the microsecond regime. And so these certainly look like single photon emitters and they look like uh, they're related to defects at a certain concentration, which gives us this saturation. So what we were able to do, so they kind of started working on this, and but we're not able to identify what types of defects were actually associated uh, with these states. So what we're able to do is now provide samples with different types and densities of defects and see how the relative intensity of these states changes. And so what we saw, so here are three samples kind of going from left to right. And the interesting thing here is that going from left to right, we're actually going to higher total defect density. Um, uh, but when we go to higher total defect density, we actually are losing these bright, uh, these states. On the other hand, if we look at the density of just the, what we call bright defects, which I'll, I'll tell you what they are in a second, or at least what type of defects they are, uh, what we see now is that the intensity of these uh, new peaks corresponds with the density of these bright defects rather than these darker defects, right? So bright and dark on STM basically are telling you whether you have a donor or an acceptor state. So we can look at these bright defects more carefully and we can see that these are in fact donor levels that are sit sitting near the conduction band. And so this allows us now to conclude that these are donor bound excitons and this paper will be coming out soon. Okay, last topic. Um, so we've been looking for about the last year or so uh, at trions in our highly pure moly uh, selenide. Uh, trions, of course, are, are, are a three particle bound state, although there's a lot of new theory kind of adding uh, more kind of details to this, this picture in TMDs. But in the simple picture, trions are a three particle bound state of an exciton. Uh, with uh, a carrier that's sitting in the conduction or valence band. And those have been, you know, seen and studied for a few years now. And what we can see is that the trions are highly uh, tunable with a gate. So this is, you can even see this at room temperature, but especially, so we can see the kind of a binding energy trion sits about 30 MeV below the exciton. And what we can see if we do a, a, a gate to gate map of the, op, uh, the photoluminescence spectrum, what we can see is that when the sample is neutral, we see dominant emission from the exciton in samples on silicon dioxide. We also see some kind of emission well below the exciton peak, which is probably a defect bound state, bound by defects not in the crystal itself, but in the substrate. And then we see the positive trion when we go to one side and the negative trion when we go to the other side. And I think I've, sorry, I've, I've inverted the text here, right? So this should be positive trion on the left when we're positively charging the material with a negative gate voltage. Uh, so these are really interesting uh, states because you can manipulate them with a gate, they're charged. So you can even hope to move them around uh, uh, you know, with a field as well. Uh, the other interesting thing about trions is they have very long valley uh, polarization because to fully relax, uh, you know, to, to change the valley polarization, you actually have to have intervalley scattering of the free electron or hole. And so you have very long valley lifetimes in these materials. Uh, the challenge has been that the quantum yield of trions has been extremely low. And this is true, you know, both definitely for TMDs, but even in more conventional systems as well. Uh, so, you know, trion quantum yield has been of order of percent or usually much, much lower than that. And that's due to very fast non-radiative decay of trions. Okay, so let me skip this. Um, the other issue with trions is there's still some debate about what the actual best representation of a trion is. And kind of at two extremes are the just a free trion where you just have a, uh, an exciton bound to a free carrier. On the other hand, there have been theories suggesting that 
the, the trions are actually defect bound excitons. Um, then you have kind of more intermediate pictures where a trion you really should think of as an attractive polaron. And more recent theory I haven't put on here is, is uh, considering then kind of the, the, if you have a free electron, you actually have a quasi hole uh, that fills its, that, that is associated with that free electron inside the valence band. So it's actually a four particle state. Okay, but let's first try to understand, is this a free particle or is it a defect bound particle? And that should be easy to discriminate just by measuring diffusion. Right? Defect bound particles should stay in one place. Free particles should diffuse easily. Again, the problem there is when you have a low quantum yield and a low lifetime, you can't measure diffusion because everything dies before it moves, right? Okay, so when we start to now measure photoluminescence in our cleaner materials. Um, right now, I'm just saying kind of flux, although I'll be more precise about which flux batch and what defect density later, uh, just in a couple of slides. Uh, what we saw in our early measurements is that actually the, the, when we looked at photoluminescence in this cleaner material, the, the width of the photoluminescence peak was more or less the same, but the quantum yield was much higher. And Interestingly, we saw that the quantum yield was dominated by the, or the, the PL was dominated by the trion. And, you know, in one of our early samples, it reached nearly 100% quantum yield. Um, okay, so to understand this in more detail, what, we, what we've been doing is, is again, doing these kind of gate dependent maps. Now I've rotated these spectra, so we're looking at uh, the spectra along the x-axis and changing gate voltage or carrier density along the y-axis. Because of this, these materials, uh, we're using graphite contacts or graphene contacts uh, to um, really minimize any optical signatures from the contact. Um, the crossover between uh, the gated or the kind of the gap region and then the when we're in the conduction and valence band is a little bit funny and we're still trying to understand that. But Basically, what we see is that when the sample is neutral, we see emission from the neutral exciton. And when the sample is fully in the, in the band, we see uh, emission, dominant emission from the trion. So here's the negative trion, and down here we see the positive trion. And there's something going on in the gap, but that's, again, hard to tell whether it's an intrinsic feature or whether it's a kind of a contact effect. All right. So this is kind of the meat of the study right here. So this is what we can now do with our different batches that we've spent all of our time painfully characterizing the type of defects and the defect density. Now we can start mapping bulk properties or single flake properties to defect density for the first time. So this has kind of been our dream and this is the first of what I hope are going to be many studies uh, that are able to, to do this kind of work. So what we can see here is a series of samples with decreasing defect density as we go from left to right. And again, this is kind of our latest batch, which we put in after our first referee reports. And then um, on the bottom, we're showing the, the photoluminescence spectra that we measure for these uh, samples. And you can see, again, things are getting much brighter as we go to the right. In fact, in the CVT, we just to get it on the same color scale, we had to multiply by 10. Uh, but we're seeing quantum yield of just a few percent in the CVT material, and now we're seeing trion quantum yield. Um, so we're measuring that at kind of the area right near the band edge uh, of now about 81% in the latest material. So that's fantastic. We're showing, you know, it's un, you know, unambiguous, not surprising, but it's nice to see very clearly that the quantum yield in these materials, this is all at low temperature. The low temperature quantum yield is absolutely limited by defect density. And when we reduce the defect density, we can dramatically boost the quantum yield. So when we can also look at other optical properties, so we can uh, look at our trion peak and measure the time resolved uh, photoluminescence. And we can see indeed that the increase in quantum yield is accompanied by an increase in lifetime which makes sense. Because we can measure both the quantum yield and the lifetime, we can actually just plug into very simple theory, so simple that I can 
kind of do it. Um, and we realize that then we can extract both the radiative lifetime and the non-radiative lifetime. So we can measure the trion radiative lifetime to be about 250 picoseconds. And we see that the non-radiative lifetime is sample dependent, but can e exceed one to two nanoseconds. Um, again, we're there. There's some disagreement about which theory we should be comparing to at this point, but uh, so that's a kind of an ongoing uh, ongoing discussion. So what we can then do, because we have this long lifetime, it's now possible to, you know, at least uh, to uh, consider measuring diffusion in these materials. So that's what we do. We can look at either the uh, just to, so what we do is we we just this is the simplest diffusion measurement you can do. You first just look at the radius of your reflected laser. Um, we also, as a, a, another measure of kind of the the illumination spot, we look at this uh, uh, basically this state inside uh, inside our gap, which we think is probably a defect bound state, and it seems to not diffuse. Um, and so uh, it seems to have roughly the same radius as the laser spot. So you'll see on the next couple slides, we'll reference that also. But the basic idea is that when we look now at the, the, the photoluminescence from our trions, we see that that uh, photoluminescence spot has broadened compared to the, the laser spot. And this gives us our trion diffusion length in a given sample. And we can, you know, uh, use a very simple diffusion model to, uh, you know, to understand what's going on. And we can try to fit our, our peak profile with this diffusion model. So again, we're using this kind of PL from this, uh, what we think is a, a defect bound state, comparing that to the uh, PL from the trions and comparing those two uh, gives us our uh, diffusion constant. So in this case, this is our best sample. We have a diffusion length of about 240 nanometers. This compares to a defect spacing of about 35 nanometers. And uh, we see diffusion constants of around four centimeters squared per second. This gets us actually, interestingly, into the neighborhood of gallium arsenide, which has been measured for trions to be about 30 centimeters squared per second. We would like to measure the trion um, mobility the only issue there is that you have to know the temperature and, uh, you know, although we know that the sample is at a base temperature of four Kelvin, we don't know the temperature of the, the kind of the, uh, the trions themselves or the, you know, electron bath as we're illuminating. So that's, that's still to be worked on. But the interesting thing is if we just kind of compare the non-radiative lifetime as a function of defect density, um, for excitons and trions, what we see is that, you know, something that explains something that was a little strange when we saw it at, at first, right? So kind of if we go back to our PL spectra, you notice that in all of these spectra that the exciton is actually always dimmer than the trion. So here we have the exciton here, here, and it's here in these other uh, plots, but you can't even see it really on the screen. That's a little funny because the exciton uh, has a much shorter lifetime, much shorter radiative lifetime. And so you would expect that it would be a lot brighter. But what we have, have seen is that the non-radiative lifetime of the trion is actually much longer than the non-radiative lifetime of, that, of the, the exciton by about three orders of magnitude. So we, we built a very simple model to try to at least kind of quantify what's going on here. And what we're basically just assuming is that our trion diffuses around and then it occasionally uh, collides with a defect and there's some probability of capture at that defect. And so that's this parameter beta. And when we do a, you know, our data seems to kind of fit this model reasonably well. Um, what we find is that the capture probability for excitons is nearly 100%. However, that capture probability for trions is only about 10%. So, and for reasons we don't fully understand yet, uh, defects are actually much 
less efficient at, uh, at um, basically causing non-radiative recombination of trions than they are for excitons. And that's what gives us this high quantum yield and very long lifetime. Okay, so with that, I think I'm on time. We have a few time, few minutes for questions, but let me just thank some of the major collaborators and funders. So the, the TMD synthesis has been a joint work with uh, Katie Barmack's group and Abai Pasupathy's group. Uh, it was originally led by postdoc Dan Rhodes, now uh, Song Liu, uh, with uh, the first uh, STM work done by Drew Edelberg. Um, many other contributors in all of these categories. Uh, the quantum transport has been done with Corey Dean's group, Xiang Zhu's group, uh, with uh, theory input from the Popich group, uh, led uh, recently by Chen Hui Shi, a postdoc uh, with our groups, and Min Shi as well. Uh, finally, the optics work has been done with uh, uh, Xiaoyang Zhu, Stefan Strauf at Stevens Institute of Technology, Xiaodong Xu at University of Washington. Uh, the try-on work was led by Bum Ho Kim with uh, Yue Luo and Yu Song Bai in the uh, Zhu group. So again, thank you to NSF for funding our MERSAC that this has been driving the synthesis and optical studies as well as funding from the Department of Energy for quantum transport and studies of defect-bound excitons. I think I've hit all of the required things well. Uh, you can report positively on me, uh, uh, Vin, for that. And I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, Dr. Hong, we have um, one question from a participant in the chat box that asked, this is earlier on in your talk. They asked, what is a good estimate on the defect density of mechanically exfoliated MOS2 from natural crystals? Um, you know, in, I, I don't know. We need to, that's something that we need to, uh, we need to check. We've done, I, so all I have is from talking to my postdoc, I don't have a slide on this and, and you know, exact numbers, but it seems like the sulfides, I, I think it can widely vary. Uh, you know, that's, there's no doubt about that. Um, we've looked at some crystals of sulfides that we've gotten commercially. So this may not be the natural material um, that seem to be, they seem to be lower defect density than the selenides in general. So, you know, made by the same, same technique. So the, the commercial sulfides seem to be cleaner than the, or let's say CVT derived sulfides seem to be lower defect density than CVT grown selenides, but I don't have a number for you. Okay. Um, so we have a few questions from Dr. Jun Zhu here at Penn State. Jun, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your questions. Hi, Jim. That was a great talk. I'm glad you've been hacking at it for the past number of years. <laughs> so very exciting. So I, uh, I have a few questions, uh, starting from the, mostly about the quantum transport. If I look at the onset of the Shubnikov de Haas, seems to be around two Tesla or so. Yeah. Right? So that's a quantum mobility of about 5,000. Now, you, you know, one could do at least a factor of 10 better in graphene. Is this just because the mass is so much heavier, or is there anything else that's, uh, that's giving uh, you yeah. a low mu q? Um... Uh, we've measured, so if we look at just the, the, the regular carrier mobility, our, our best numbers in, in, I think, so these were the, not the latest generation of crystals. So these were kind of, you know, middle generation tungsten selenide. Uh, uh -huh. Those we've measured, you know, kind of straight carrier mobility to be about 20,000. Right. You know, so you're still a factor of 10 off, right? If you look at the carrier density, the defect yeah. density, one, you know, and you ask uh, what would uh, what would one get in graphene, both in, in terms of the, the quantum mobility and the carrier mobility, you, you, you'd be a factor of 10 better than what the numbers that yeah, you're that's telling right. me now. Right? That's right. Yeah. So but of course the mass is a lot heavier. So I'm curious. Uh, is it all in the mass? Because right, you got if you got the same tau, then you your mobility is the uh, mass is the bottom. 
I have to go. Well, it's, you know it's what not, mask these it's, things have. Um, right, it's not it's not exactly the tau because we also you know if you think about the kind of scattering length, right? Then you also have Fermi velocity, but that's yeah, that's all it's already in the tau. Right. If you take yeah. if you take the onset of the B field, you get a quantum mobility. Mu that's right. Q. That's right. And that's uh, uh, e times tau q divided yeah. by m star, right? So so. If one has a really heavy mass, then one gets a low number, even though tau could be very, could be very long, and that's a that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering whether this is a, what you're seeing now that uh, the tau is pretty good, but but the mass is heavy. And how I think heavy so. Would the I mass think so. Be? And I think I think you know we're hoping that if we just look at our defect densities, if everything scales with defect density, which it may not. Um, you know, right. we're looking for another factor of let's say four or five improvement. Okay. We're trying to measure samples now. Um, you know, then then you get into questions of you know, are the is the scattering cross section the same for graphene versus TMDs? And yeah, I don't it's a factor of two, and, and yeah. we're talking about quantum, so you don't have to worry about long versus short and all of that stuff. Yeah. So roughly speaking, one should, you know, look at the defect density and be able to assess this number reasonably well. Yeah. But it could be the mass is, is very big. I'm curious whether with this kind of data that you have, one could get a really good measurement of the mass. We should Has, discuss. Have you guys yeah. done that? We, we probably have, have the data that you not. can just pull yeah. it out. Yeah. Right. Right. This yeah, our best our best data right now is on bilayer. So I think we're we're going to be working hard on monolayer in the next you know few months. Kevin, um, do I have time to ask more, or you have other uh, people queuing? Let's, um, let's try let's try one in between here, Jun. Um, so yeah, we can, ask, we can uh, zoom later too. So that, I'd be happy to do that. So we'll ask uh, Shwami Nathan to go ahead and unmute. Oh, th thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Professor Horn. It's a very interesting data on the trion luminescence. I have a couple of questions. One is uh, straightforward. Uh, did you look at the luminescence as a function of excitation intensity to see whether you will see the bound exciton luminescence at low excitation and maybe the trion at the high excitation? We did. I don't have that in a slide form, I sh that should be in my backup deck. <laughs> um, but very briefly, uh, what we see of as the bound exciton does seem to have a, a subunity uh, power dependence. And, but the trion and exciton states seem to have a, a very nice linear power dependence. Yeah, but, but really strictly speaking, the trion consisting of three particles, you should have a three half dependence, but uh, yeah. generally that's not seen. Usually you see only a linear dependence, which could be due to various other effects. Uh, so I was just wondering whether that could be an excitation dependence. My second question is a little bit more, I'm struggling to understand fundamentally. Uh, typically in a semiconductor that I know of, it, you know, the, there is only one non-radiative recombination lifetime. Uh, the recombina non-radiative recombination centers don't really care whether the radiative part is, you know, is emerging from your bound exciton, exciton defects or whatever. So I'm a little bit puzzled to understand why the non-radiative lifetime be different depending upon the radiative path, whether it is a exciton or it's a trion? Um, I, I share your confusion. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the papers that we've read, there are some previous theory that has suggested that, um, you know, you have a kind of a Pauli blocking. When you have a trion that you have a kind of a free, a free particle that comes from the band into this bound state. And then if you, that recombines, you have to get that particle back into the band. And uh, there's a kind of a Pauli blocking uh, process at work. However, the same authors have more recently published uh, kind of new interpretations um, that we're still trying to understand. Uh, it's, it's more to kind of the, the well, actually, 
there have been no, they, they've looked at the radiative lifetime, but the, there's been no rigorous theory on non-radiative recombination of trions. Okay, thank, thank you. Something yeah. to think about, thank you. So I, you know, I hope we'll motivate that. Yeah, thank you. Well, with that, uh, Dr. Holm, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. I wanna thank you so much for coming today. We'll be in touch with everyone on the next webinar at a future time. So we'll stop the recording, but up to Dr. Hone, how long he wants to stay um, to answer any additional questions. Yeah.